<clears throat> Can you guys hear me? Sorry, I'm just trying to get the chat. Okay guys, can you can you hear me? Hi. Can everyone who's uh who's watching can they just um write something down in the comments saying that they're here and they can hear me and then I can um start the lecture. There is a short, um, there is a short lag uh, time. Uh, I think it's roughly about ten to fifteen seconds. Um, so that's why I will, um, whenever I change the slides, uh, I think I will negate for that time, so you guys don't miss out on anything I say. Um, and we'll take it nice and slowly. And we've we've got two hours as well, so um, should be enough time to get through this system. Um, it's quite a big uh, topic in general um, and I mean it would be uh, it would take quite a long time to go through everything quite thoroughly um, and so I'm hoping that uh, you guys have been studying um, during this quarantine period um, and I'm going to go through kind of all of the information things, or sorry, all of the uh, important things that are worth going through. Um, and I will also add to it, um, because if you go through the slides and if you read it, um, you'll notice a few things are missing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just, just listen out. And if you missed it, just, um, just tell me in the comment section. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll revisit it and then we can start, you know, start all over again. So, uh, let's start. <clears throat> so for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Stephen, um, I'm from the UK, uh, and I'm currently in the UK, um, and I'm in the fifth year. Uh, I quite like, uh, GIT related topics physiology, anatomy, um, pathology, so this is um, something that interests me quite a lot, so um, in my lecture I've added quite a few things uh, which can be correlated with, you know, in clinical practice, um, because I think it's quite important for you guys to understand the, in the actual relevance of the anatomy rather than just um, learning it for the sake of passing the exam. Um, but it's more so for getting the entire picture. Um, and here's my email. Um, if you guys have any more questions, um, yeah, feel free to take it down or ask me at the end. Um, so yeah, um, format of the lecture. Uh, obviously, we'll start off with the lecture outcomes. Um, your study guide, my study guide, really. Um, so I'll kind of give you a few um, pointers, uh, how I did things, um, what worked for me, um, what could work for you guys as well, uh, and then we'll go through um, the entire GIT, so we'll start off with the mouth and then we'll end up in the anal canal, um, and the first, uh, or at least in terms of the mouth and the oral cavity, uh, I won't really be going into too much detail with that just because I think that there are other topics, uh, especially in this system, which need a bit more time. Um, but the mouth is relatively simple, I would say. Um, yeah, so without further ado, I think we should get, get going. Um, so yeah, like I said, uh, by the end of this lecture, I would like to think that you um, leave with the appropriate knowledge 
um, understand the entire relevance uh, of the anatomy, uh, make a few clinical correlations, um, and kind of, you know, make the links, try and think of what could be going wrong, um, in, you know, in the future when you're, when you're in, when you're in hospital, when you're in placement, um, <clears throat> and then, you know, as, as the lecture goes on, I will try and, uh, give some consolidation tips for, um, dissection final exams, um, yeah. So, my study guide, uh, yeah, we'll just need it for the lag. So, my, uh, my study guide, uh, how I, um, revised for the final exam, um, was, I think I had my lessons in the first semester on, on Wednesday, um, and in the second semester, I think I had it on on Friday, maybe or Thursday, some some point later on in the week. Um, and I think the the lectures were usually at the start of the week, um, or sometimes it was a bit backwards, and they're at the end. Um, and what I used to do is I would read the entire chapter and I would make my notes, um, and so when I would go to the dissection labs and the seminar, I would have read over things at least twice, um, and then uh, I would kind of um, it, this this is especially what was useful for dissections because I already had a foundation base um, to kind of um, add more knowledge um, from that point, and obviously when I would look at the cadavers, then kind of had. Um, you know, I, I, I knew a thing or two before starting, basically. Um, I would use the white book uh, at the start. I was quite reluctant to use university literature in their lectures. Um, but in the end, after about a month, I think it was the, the best decision, I think the wisest decision uh, when it comes to passing exams, because... Uh, obviously, they they're, they're going to ask you, you know, everything from that book, which is which is kind of taken from Gray's Anatomy, a bunch of other anatomy textbooks. So it's got a good combination. It is quite dense, even though it's quite thin, but it is dense in information. Um, but yeah, uh, so use that. Um, second point I've written is draw, draw some more, and draw even more. Uh, and the reason I say draw and draw and draw is just because if you're not making the link with your hands and, you know, if you're not making the visual link, um, you won't really understand the anatomy and you won't be able to kind of get yourself out of tricky positions in anatomy dissection exams or even when they ask you questions in the class. And obviously the final exam, because <clears throat> if you can picture things in your head, if you can visualize things really head in your head, um, it makes things just really, really easy, and you can dig yourself out of many, many holes. So this is going to sound a bit cringy, but um, almost well, when I was learning, um, it was almost every single night I felt like. I could visualize what I had learnt just because I'd seen the atlas so many times, I'd drawn so many things. Um, and yeah, sometimes you literally visualize yourself inside the body and just you know, looking inside um, all kinds of uh, bursas and uh, foramens, etc. So it's really kind of sad and cringy, but it does help you pass this exam. Um, third thing, use atlases to consolidate. Uh, and try and describe the images you've um, you've read up on. So what I mean by that is, um, if you have any atlas, if you have Sabota or Netta or um, Gray's, whichever atlas, there there's so many more. Team, whatever you use, if you if you let's say if you've read the information, um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, if you read the information and if you look at the um, the figure or the the image in the atlas, 
you should be able to describe what's going on. So you should be able to, for example, if it's the, uh, let's say if it's the spleen. So you should be able to, uh, you know, uh, make the links with the real impression, etc. Superior margin, superior pole, blah, 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 blah. So use the Atlas as a revision tool after you've read things maybe twice or thrice and try and describe it. Musculoskeletal system, same thing when it comes to the muscle or, uh, origin, insertion, um, action and function, etc. Um, <coughs> sorry about my cough. Um, that's for the final exam. Uh, dissection wise, um, I use Net as flashcards quite religiously. Um, and I think for those of you who have them, um, I think they're a really, really nice um, tool. Um, and, you know, you can lay them out on the table and you can even, um, you can, uh, you can put them on top of each other um, and make, uh, you know, layers or groups of muscles like that as well. And you can work your way from top superficial all the way to deep, for example. Um, so those are really good. Highly recommend those. Obviously your atlases. Sabota was the one I used. Um, you can use almost anything, but as long as you're using the atlas and you're looking at the images and just completely um, just smashing it into your head, basically. Um, <coughs> And yeah, uh, if you're not dreaming about the images at some point before your exam, you should be. Uh, and you should be in a position where you're just thinking about it all the time because it's the best way and the easiest way to pass the exam. Third one, I really should have put um, an asterisk on this because this is, I think this is quite extensive and quite extra. Um, but it is very comprehensive and it just double. Um, just, you know, reaffirms your knowledge, essentially. And uh, it's by uh, Dr. Ackland, who does his own um, anatomy cadaver um, uh, di dissection videos, basically. Um, and, I mean, especially if you've got dissection exams, I think that's a really, really good... Um, tool to be using. You do have to pay for it, but on YouTube you can get quite a few uh, free videos, so check it out and watch it because um, it's very, very good. So on to the next slide. <coughs> so sorry about my cough. Um, if it's really, really loud, um, just let me know in the comment section and I can turn my volume down a bit. So what is the gastrointestinal system? Um, so, so an in introduction to it, um, the primary purpose of the GIT is to obviously break down the food uh, which we take into our mouth, which we will digest into, um, you know, break it down into nutrients essentially, into individual cell units. Uh, which can be absorbed all along the GIT tract. <coughs> it starts from the mouth, obviously. Um, then it enters the um, uh, the, the esophagus. Um, and from the esophagus, it goes all the way down to the stomach and it exits at the anus. Um, that's the introduction. So, the oral cavity, like I said in the previous slide, um, the whole process of digestion starts in the oral cavity uh, or the mouth. It's obviously composed of the tongue, um, the hard palate, the soft palate, and the teeth. Um, obviously, in this cavity, we have a lot of enzymes such as uh, amylase, uh, which will start breaking down... Um, carbohydrates into um, 
individual um, parts which can then be digested and absorbed later on. Um, mastication uh, is an important word. Uh, mastication refers to the mechanical breakdown of food by chewing and chopping actions of the teeth. Um, yeah. As for the teeth, um, I think personally I didn't go into too much detail with teeth when I was um, revising uh, and the oral cavity, especially when I was revising for final exam and dissection exams. Um, but I think uh, obviously my time is different um, and I would advise you to to do a little bit of reading up on this chapter. I don't think it's very long. It is quite straightforward, but it's something that has to be um, read. Uh, and obviously we have salivary glands, which produce saliva. So we have three pairs of salivary glands um, in uh, around the oral cavity. Um, we have the parotid, the sublingual, and the submandibular. And each of those glands uh, can be divided into smaller segments called lobes. Um, and these lobes are quite important when it comes to pathologies. Um, for example, when, for example, there's a tumor in the um, you know, parotid uh, gland, um, and we need to um, essentially clear the lobes um, to make sure which has the cancerous cells, which doesn't have the cancerous cells. So this is um, where knowing the uh, the segments is quite useful. <coughs> um, and they all create um, saliva. That's the uh, end product. Uh, but the composition and the, you could say, the concentration is all different. So... I think the white book would tell you that the parotid probably um, has a higher concentration of um, saliva than uh, the others. Um, so yeah, I mean, you have to read read this chapter basically, um, <coughs> and then from the from the um, from the mouth, uh, obviously the food will travel via the esophagus um, due to peristalsis which we're going to go through very soon. So this is, um, this is the, the mouth and the oral cavity. Um, what I haven't um, added in this uh, slideshow is actually the external aspect of the mouth as well, because um, I think learning um, features such as, um, you know, the, the angle, um, <clears throat> filtrum, etc. I think that's quite uh, a basic but kind of prerequisite um, piece of knowledge that you should have. So I'm sorry, that's not added. Um, but yeah, and these are the salivary glands that I mentioned. So this is obviously the parotid gland. This is the uh, sublingual gland, because obviously this is our tongue. And then this is the submandibular gland. Um, and does anyone know what this is? If they can just comment in the section, uh, in the chat section, that would be very, very good of them. This green feature here. Yeah, it's obviously the, the parotid duct. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think this anatomy of this region is quite important when it comes to surgery especially because um, this muscle here is your um, masseter muscle uh, and obviously you'd have the bucinator 
on the inferior aspect. Um, this is the mouth in the oral cavity. So we're going to move on to the esophagus now. So um, the esophagus is a fibromuscular tube. Uh, it's roughly 25 um, centimeters in length, um, which is reasonably long. Uh, and it originates in C6 vertebra and uh, extends all the way down to TH11. <clears throat> really TH10, um, but you'll understand why. Um, <clears throat> and the anatomical pathway that it follows um, is that it just obviously it descends downwards um, from the oral cavity into the superior metastinum. Uh, off the thorax and it's located posterior to the trachea and its entry point into the abdominal cavity is the esophageal hiatus uh, and it's roughly um, at the level of TH10 um, and it's uh, also on the right hand side of the diaphragm so <clears throat> in the right cruise uh, of the diaphragm that's when the or that's where the esophagus will be passing through and it will uh, as it passes through that um, opening it will um, <clears throat> slightly um, deviate towards um, the left very slightly and left and posteriorly um, and yeah that's usually at the level of T11 uh, it terminates by joining the cardiac orifice of the stomach or the cardia of the stomach. Um, so obviously composed of four layers which um, are important for peristalsis um, and uh, I'm going to discuss those four layers in the next slide. Um, and another part of the esophagus which is very very critical to its function is that it has sphincters, so it has um, two sphincters, um, one which is upper and one which is lower. Uh, the upper sphincter is a anatomical sphincter, um, and it's usually at the junction between the pharynx and the esophagus, uh, and it's produced by the cricopharyngeus muscle. So the difference between an anatomical sphincter and a physiological sphincter is that a physiological sphincter is something that uh, is obviously crucial to the physiological function of it, whereas anatomical sphincter is something that is produced um, when um, or during embryology, uh, and it's more so for uh, providing structure, possibly, you could say, uh, whereas physiological is actually for functioning. Um, and the lower uh, sphincter is in the gastroesophageal junction, uh, which is left of TH11. <coughs> and uh, the important thing about uh, the esophagus is that it prevents the entry of air and the reflux of gastric contents. Because um, imagine if you didn't have um, a lower sphincter um, so you would have no control, essentially, of your stomach contents and there would be no way for you to guarantee that whatever you eat is passed out, which is an important function in life. Um, so upper, lower, they're both incredibly important. Um, right, so the anatomical relations um, of the esophagus um, basically you can break it down to the upper, um, upper, middle and lower section of the esophagus and it's related to, um, <clears throat> it's related to firstly the arch of the aorta because it is passing, uh, posteriorly to it. Um, it is also related to the left main stem of the bronchus, so before the bronchus can separate into um, its uh, secondary uh, bronchi and then it's obviously um, terminal uh, 
bronchi and the bronchioles. It has to go through the left main stem. And the cricoid cartilage is also um, one of its most important relations because it's obviously posterior to, posterior to it. Um, and then last but not least, you have the diaphragmatic um, hiatus, which is basically the opening um, which is passing through. And whilst these relations obviously indicate the pathway of the esophagus, they're also very important when it comes to its physiological constrictions. So when I say physiological constrictions, um, I mean, uh, for example, this happens more in um, children, but there's no limit to, or there's no age limit to, who can swallow foreign bodies. Um, and basically, um, these four um, parts of the esophagus, or these four parts uh, of the relation to the esophagus are parts where those areas are heavily constricted and um, those are areas where there can be foreign bodies um, stuck um, and and so yeah this is why these four um, relations are quite important <clears throat> and the following slide we'll go through the the layers of the esophagus so Right, so uh, this is, for example, this is, uh, obviously this is its lumen, so this is, all the food is passing through here. Um, so uh, obviously the outermost uh, layer is the adventitia. Um, adventitia is uh, present in the esophagus, but it's not always present in every single um, organ, as you guys know already from your um, lectures. <coughs> and then the second layer is our <coughs> proper muscular layer. So in this proper muscular layer we'll have our um, circular muscle and our longitudinal muscle which will help with the contraction um, and peristalsis process in order to provide um, or in order to help food to be passed down all the way to the stomach. Uh, then you have the submucosa uh, in the submucosa, that's where you will find the vessels uh, and the nerves as well. Uh, and then obviously then you have the, uh, the lining of the lumen, which is um, made of the mucosa and the epithelium. Um, yeah, so these are the constrictions, the relations of the constrictions, which I was talking about. So we have... Uh, Cricoid cartilage, which is one of the constrictions here. We have the arch of the uh, arch of the aorta. Uh, we have our left main or the left stem of the uh, bronchus here, which is another part. And the last bit <coughs> uh, or the last um, part, which can become constricted at times, is the diaphragmatic um, uh, hiatus. Uh, opening so just here just before it passes through into the into the actual um, stomach and the cardiac orifice so like I promised um, and I think it's quite important that we talk about the clinical correlations with um, the esophagus Right, so uh, on the left, uh, on the left is a endoscopy, uh, upper um, esophago gastro duodenoscopy, OGD, um, and it's basically a um, endoscope which goes through your mouth, um, and it's to assess um, for Barrett's esophagus. Now, Barrett's esophagus is a um, pre-malignant um, lesion, so pre-malignant lesion meaning that um, it's basically um, a, a lesion which is, like the name says, um, just before cancer can possibly be um, 
seen in place uh, before the cells start rapidly dividing and it turns into a cancer. Uh, so <clears throat> usually this is caused uh, by number of um, number of reasons. It can be caused by um, poor sphincter um, function in the lower uh, lower esophagus. Uh, it can be caused by excessive coffee, alcohol, and um, essentially your gastric contents um, will be uh, refluxing all the way up your esophagus. Um, and obviously they're highly acidic, so when they're highly acidic, uh, they have the ability to um, you know, scored the inside um, mucosa and uh, the epithelium. So usually in a normal um, esophagus you would expect to see squamous cell epithelium. Um, but what happens is when you have um, gastric uh, or gastroesophageal reflux disease called uh, the gastric um, content starts spinning in back in or back up the esophagus and the lining of the stomach then starts to take over the lining of the esophagus so that's not good news usually um, because um, that can be a cause of cancer and it can be a cause of um, the entire cells dividing rapidly which can then cause a cancer <clears throat> so this is Barrett's esophagus and this is a OGD uh, image so once you've passed uh, from the esophagus, um, you obviously enter the stomach. So the stomach is a uh, J-shaped bag, and it has um, four anatomical regions. Um, it's composed of the cardia, uh, the fundus, um, the body, and then the pylorus. Pylorus is the inferior aspect, uh, and the also the, um, the part of the stomach where we start to um, uh, get into the duodenum. <clears throat> it's composed of two margins. Um, so uh, on the, uh, you could say the medial aspect, when you, when you see the image uh, coming up, you'll have the lesser curvature. And then the most lateral aspect of this bag is the greater curvature. <clears throat> and the lesser curvature, its most um, inferior part uh, is known as the angular notch. And this is usually where you find the junction uh, of the body and the pylorus. Um, and basically, uh, what, you, what you get to um, see there, you wouldn't see it, but microscopically and histologically you would see a shift in some certain cells and uh, some of those cells would be um, muscle cells. So you would find that there would be more muscles uh, and more contractions in the pyloric region than let's say the entire uh, body. Well there, there are muscles in the body as well. And the, le uh, the lesser curvature gives rise to... gives rise... gives rise to the hepatogastric ligament, uh, which is <clears throat> an important fold when it comes to um, keeping um, all of the structures in their place. Um, <clears throat> and like I've said, the sphincters before they they, they limit the um, the contents. So this uh, pyloric sphincter regulates the amount of food. Um, that enters, uh, sorry, what I meant to say was the esophageal sphincter regulates the amount of food that enters the stomach and the pyloric sphincter will regulate the amount of food that is passed on from the stomach to the duodenum and the small intestine and onwards. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned before, so two sphincters, the first um, sphincter, uh, pretend that you're passing through the esophagus, pretend your food, it's weird, but just pretend. So the first sphincter that you have to pass through is the inferior esophageal sphincter at T11. Um, and then um, 
once you're inside the stomach, then all of this, uh, all of the enzymes, all of the acids, um, will be you know produced, and you'll be mixing, uh, and you'll produce chyme, which is digested contents. Uh, and then when you have to be pushed out of the stomach, then you'd have to go to the pyloric sphincter. So this controls the exit, and it's made up of smooth muscle. And if you just look at this image of the entire stomach, So, uh, this is the lower part of the esophagus. Um, this is where you'd find the uh, inferior esophageal sphincter. Um, and then, uh, like I said, this is a J-shaped bag. On the lateral margin, you have got the uh, greater curvature here. <clears throat> the greater curvature here, and then you've got the lesser curvature here. The inferior margin of the lesser curvature, where the junction, um, where the junction between the pylorus and the body of the stomach, this is known as the angular notch. This region right here, right between pyloric sphincter and the lesser curvature, this is the angular notch. <laughs> Um, obviously, you've got the the fundus, this aspect here. <coughs> um, this is the cardia of the um, the esophagus. Sorry, of the stomach. Um, and the cardia. I remember when it comes to the multiple choice question robot. Um, they really, really like to ask about the cardia. Um, because a lot of people get confused whether the cardia is actually a part of the stomach or it's actually a part of um, the esophagus. And uh, so, yeah, when it comes to um, revising it, just be aware and just double um, double check um, the location of the cardia because, for example, each book um, has it sometimes a bit inconsistent. Personally, I, I think the stomach um, contains part of the cardia and also part of the esophagus. In some literature, you find that the esophagus actually contains the cardia. So it sounds really simple, but it confused me as well when I was, when I was learning it. Um, and yeah. Uh, and like the esophagus, we have um, different layers uh, of the stomach because it's it's a muscle as well it's a muscular bag um, so you have the circular muscle layer um, which is the innermost layer and then the outermost layer is the longitudinal muscle layer and this is the complete opposite to the esophagus because with the esophagus you've got the longitudinal muscle layer as the inner part and the circular muscle layer is the outermost part so uh, yeah just clear yourselves up on those um, I think they're really simple once again um, but it's just those simple things which you just really need to know um, Rage, uh these are quite important um, in terms of the dissection exam um, because you can see these kind of uh, muscular fenestrations inside the stomach, fenestrations and lines, however you want to describe it. Um, and, for example, I got asked in my dissection exam, uh, is this muscle? It's not muscle. Rage are just, um, you could say, they are just... Um, it's just an expansion of the mucosa, basically, because it's a it's a muscular pouch which fills out uh, when it's full, and when it fills out, then your rugae disappear. You don't really find them there, and it's really only when there's nothing in the stomach that they're visible. So they're really extensions of the mucosa. Um, but once again, just double check these definitions uh, with the um, with the university literature book. And 
Um, when it comes to the vascular supply of the stomach, um, in this particular region we have got a lot of things going on. <coughs> a lot of things going on. Um, then we have a one. Uh, well, we've got, we have the first big trunk um, of the uh, abdominal aorta, um, and it's a um, anterior branch uh, of the abdominal aorta. So you have the celiac trunk, um, and the celiac trunk will um, provide three um, three uh, main anterior branches, uh, which will supply. Um, the stomach completely and also um, the spleen and the liver so um, it gives off three um, three uh, three divisions straight away so it gives off the left gastric artery it gives off the splenic artery which goes directly to the spleen and then it gives off the common hepatic artery which will then um, form the proper hepatic artery which will be the or which will have its final destination uh, into the liver um, <clears throat> and so when it comes to providing um, the uh, vascular supply of <clears throat> the lesser curvature so uh, the lesser curvature will be getting most of its blood supply from the left gastric artery which will give short gastric arteries to the lesser curvature and also the cardia um, and also you will find branches which also provide uh, blood supply to the esophagus um, and uh, when it comes to the uh, greater curvature of the stomach uh, that will be formed by um, branches uh, from the gastroduodenal artery uh, which is one of the branches of the common hepatic artery um, and it will form an anastomosis with the left gastro um, <clears throat> epiploic or gastroamental artery um, and that will provide uh, the blood supply for the greater curvature right here so you can see that you have the left gastroepiploic uh, arteries. Yep, you can see that uh, you have the left gastroepiploic vessels here, uh, and you'll have the right gastroepiploic vessels uh, on this margin, which are being provided uh, from the gastroduodenal artery, which is one of the branches of the common hepatic artery. Um, and the left gastroepiploic artery is actually coming from the splenic artery just before it gets to the spleen so you have the spleen here <clears throat> just before you get to the spleen you have one big branch which gives off the left gastroepiploic artery and also short gastric um, vessels here um, yeah so the correlation uh, with the the stomach and especially the um, the um, diaphragmatic um, hiatus or the opening is that um, sometimes you can have um, your stomach um, passed all the way up uh, into your thoracic cavity so you, you have to kind of visualize it this is the thoracic cavity here and you have your stomach uh, somewhere there in the middle um, and this stomach can sometimes protrude into the trachea um, and when it protrudes into the trachea you can sometimes have um, some uh, respiratory um, symptoms you know you could have shortness of breath you could not be able to breathe because the stomach is completely compressing it um, <clears throat> but most often um, what happens is that the esophagus uh, tends to pass through further up and the sphincter here, which is normally here at the lower margin, is pushed upwards. Um, and 
you know, there's many, many different types of hiatal hernias, um, and this isn't a um, a general surgery lecture, unfortunately, but <clears throat> this is your correlation with, with the anatomy, that sometimes the cardia can actually be pushed up into the thorax, uh, and that's a big issue because at that moment then, you know, you could have lots of reflux and you can sometimes have compression of the um, the trachea. Um, so yeah, it's a big problem. <clears throat> and it's also becoming increasingly common these days with our diets. So next part um i mean if we were really following this story we should really talk about the the duodenum but uh, i think the internal organs are quite important when it comes to understanding um, the gastrointestinal system <clears throat> uh, so we're going to talk about the liver now the liver obviously produces bile and it has uh, many many uh, metabolic functions um, and it's heavily involved in the biochemistry uh, you know, coagulation factors, um, detoxification of uh, toxic substances, um, just all round meta uh, metabolism. Metabolism, sorry. <clears throat> it is the biggest gland uh, in the body. Uh, it's roughly about one, uh, one and a half kilograms. Uh, and it's located in the right upper quadrant. So if you know your quadrants, uh, just underneath the um, your your right uh, inferior margin of your ribs, that's the right upper quadrant. So your your liver would be found there. Uh, usually, you can't feel the liver um, unless you're very very skinny, um, or for example, there's some pathology, some inflammation. Uh, only then can you really feel the liver. <clears throat> and uh, when it comes to the centipede, um, liver is obviously very important. Um, so posteriorly, uh, the right lobe of the uh, liver, liver, sorry, the liver. Um, so this is your uh, right lobe, um, and this uh, will be related to the kidney. So you have the renal uh, impression here, um, and also the suprarenal gland, um, because the right suprarenal gland sits just above the kidney, um, and also, you will get this bottom liver surface here, some round about just underneath the renal impression, you would have the duodenal impression. <clears throat> For the um, superior um, aspect of the duodenum, which is the first part of the duodenum, um, and you'd also have the right colic flexure, which would be the most um, you'd have the right colic flexure and the colic impression. Um, and the left lobe is related to the, esophag uh, the esophagus and the esophageal impression and the, um, the gastric impression as well. So, I mean, these images aren't the best, but if you use a really good atlas, um, I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, and a little bit about the, the unit of the liver. So uh, it's composed of a fibrous capsule um, and the individual parts of the liver are made up of uh, hepatic lobules and so they're, they're surrounding, um, you could think of this little kind of circle as the hepatic uh, lobules um, and this little um, the centermost piece here, this is the small central vein. And you've got hepatic lobules all around uh, all around it, surrounding it, and this is this the small central vein, uh, which will then lead on to the hepatic vein. <coughs> um, yeah, so blood flow is venous wise, you um, is from the portal vein. Portal vein is a yeah, it's a connection of um, let's let's see who's uh, <clears throat> who's paying attention who's been learning so um, 
the portal vein uh, comes from which veins? If you guys just um, type up in the comment section, just so I know what you guys think about this. Okay, <laughs> so uh, okay, so the portal vein is um, made up of the uh, union between the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein, um, um, and yeah, it obviously leads all the way to the the liver, uh, and its arterial supply is from the um, proper hepatic artery, which I said is the terminal branch of the common hepatic artery which is the um, one of the three branches of the um, celiac trunk um, yeah and then carrying on with this liver so you have the diaphragmatic surface uh, and you're probably wondering I didn't mention the ligaments well I'm going to mention them now um, and so this is this is the diaphragmatic surface right um, because it's the superior aspect and it's the part that is in uh, contact with the diaphragm, especially the right cruise of the diaphragm. And you'll also know that the right cruise of the diaphragm is also in contact with the esophagus because that's its entry point. So the superior part, most of it is fused with the diaphragm and you have a, um, a bare uh, area here, this bit here, <clears throat> which defines the coronary ligament that will continue into forming two branches. Uh, so, I'm oh, sorry, not two branches, but two um, extensions of itself. So you will have the right triangular ligament and the left triangular ligament. And uh, then um, they will both terminate uh, into the fibrous appendix, which I don't have a picture of but uh, a fibrous appendix appendix is basically an extension of something so it can be of fibers it can be of actual tissue uh, so yeah that's it maybe there's a <clears throat> basically your fibrous appendix let's wait for the lag your fibrous appendix would be in the superior part um, right here where this is the coronary ligament right here <clears throat> um okay and so yeah so this is the coronary ligament which is made up of the right triangular ligament and the left triangular ligament and this is our coronary ligament um the anterior part <clears throat> is uh obviously covered by peritoneum uh, and it is di uh, divided into the, <coughs> sorry, it divides <coughs> the the right lobe and the left lobe, um, and it's divided by the falciform ligament, um, which is probably the most um, visible ligament when it comes to dissections because uh, it's just the most simple one that you can see. And it's usually the one that most people are asked to point out. Um, the visceral surface, the visceral surface would be the interior, um, um, in, in, interior aspect, if you're looking from behind the liver. So <clears throat> you have the, um, you have fissures. So <clears throat> fissures are small grooves, small canals, um, which uh, you might find um, vessels passing through, you might find uh, ligaments um, passing through or nerves, um, especially in the liver it's usually the ligaments <clears throat> and also the vessels. So in the right sagittal fissure which is right here, it's like a H shape, you'll, you'll see the visceral surface. In the right sagittal fissure um, you have the posterior, uh, you have the posterior groove of the um, inferior vena cava 
um, and the inferior vena cava is actually fixed um, into that groove by a fibrous um, band known as the vena cava ligament um, and anteriorly uh, you will find the fossa of the um, gallbladder uh, and obviously you have the right and you have the left so the left sagittal fissure um, um, it's usually, most people it's um, composed of the uh, venous ligament, uh, of the venous duct, which is occluded and it's not functioning. Um, and anteriorly, you would um, you find the, the round ligament of the liver, which, uh, well, it contains the occluded umbilical vein. So, um, you know, once once you've been born, um, and your uh, umbilical artery has been um, clamped, within a few days, all of these things will be occluded, and um, you can start developing um, the functional uh, vascular system of um, developing um, adults uh, or children. Um, <clears throat> like I said, with this with the salivary glands. Um, Segments are very important, and the liver has um, eight segments. Um, if you look up segments on YouTube, um, you tend to find uh, quite a few mnemonics, and you also tend to find a lot of fists. Um, that's because the fist is one of the um, best ways, probably, to remember the segments, and your thumb included. So your thumb is the segment one and working um, from the um, from the left to the right then you'd have segment two segment three segment four and then segment five segment six segment seven and then segment eight on your uh, ring finger on your forefinger in the um, upper part so that's a easy way of remembering the segments of the liver <clears throat> and the yeah, okay. So uh, you know the liver and the gallbladder, they're all um, related with the biliary tract um, and the uh, hepatic duct. <clears throat> so if you look at this image here, this scheme, uh, number one is the right hepatic duct. So that's coming from the right uh, lobe, and the second. Um, second annotation here is the left hepatic duct, uh, and that's obviously coming from the left hepatic duct. <clears throat> this, number four, is the common hepatic duct. So once the bile's been produced, uh, it's all going to be going down this um, these ducts here. Uh, you've obviously got the gallbladder here, <coughs> and then you've got the um, <clears throat> the uh, the bile. Uh, sorry, the cystic duct. And then this here is the pancreatic duct. So you've got the gallbladder, you've got the liver, and then you've got the pancreas involved uh, in this function. Um, and obviously, number nine is the hepatopancreatic ampulla, also vatas, um, vatas papilla. And um, I think the the relevance of this scheme here is that um, a lot of people have. Um, gallbladder uh, stones um, and uh, not all of them need operations and with so many advancements um, we can track um, we can track and we can also relieve all the pain caused by the, the um, stones compressing in the duct uh, using a ERCP which is the uh, endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreaticography <clears throat> and it's a it's an interventional procedure uh, it's, uh, it can be performed by gastroenterologist uh, interventional radiologist uh, and basically um, pass an endoscope and then through the endoscope you pass a small guide wire and this guide wire will have two kind of tongs uh, which can grab the stones and you can yank the stones um, and you can also cut um, <clears throat> the the valve 
uh, because there's a valve here by the uh, hepatopancreatic ampulla. So you can do a, uh, it's not a valve, it's actually a sphincter. So you can do a sphincterotomy, which is opening up the sphincter to allow the stones to pass, and you can pass those stones when you defecate. Um, and the important um, uh, point that I want to make about ERCP and the biliary tract is, um, the biliary tract is incredibly important, and in uh, laparoscopic surgery, um, it can be harmed, and once it can be harmed, it can cause a lot of problems in the future uh, with leakage and also fibrosis and, and stones and recurrent stones and infections as well. So uh, it's very important that we learn this anatomy well uh, so we don't damage um, <clears throat> the uh, any of these ducts. Uh, and if we do, it's called a, um, a CBD injury, it's a common bile duct injury. So uh, next part is the gallbladder. The gallbladder uh, is uh, a piriform sac. It's, it's roughly about seven to 10 uh, centimeters long. Uh, and it is uh, seven to 10 centimeters long. And um, it can contain roughly about 30 to 50 mil of, um, of juice. Um, I don't actually mean juice, but you know the type of juice I'm talking about. And it's attached to the liver by connective tissue. Um, and like many other organs, um, uh, it's obviously composed of um, <coughs> a mucosa um, and a muscular layer. So it has circular muscle which um, allows it to contract to um, produce all of its bile juice so it can pass through the, sp the spiral folds and into the uh, common bile duct. Um, <clears throat> like I said, it's made up of the fundus. So your fundus is here. And this fundus is in contact with the abdominal wall. Uh, and this point is known as the Murphy's point. So uh, if you have inflammation or uh, stones cause, causing the inflammation, uh, you can sometimes have a painful gallbladder or a painful right upper quadrant. And when we palpate, uh, palpate under the uh, inferior margin of the right ribs, um, we can feel the fundus of the gallbladder. So this is an important um, topographical landmark. Um, for um, us when it comes to taking examinations. And then we obviously have the body and then the neck of the, the gallbladder. Um, <clears throat> and uh, its uh, neurovascular supply is from the cystic artery, which is uh, a branch of the uh, right hepatic artery. So there's no such... Um, before before you get to the um, the individual right um, aspect and the left aspect of the hepatic artery, um, it there's no branch from the proper hepatic artery which gives off the cystic artery. It's actually from the right hepatic artery um, where you get a branch of the cystic artery um, and the veins. Um, obviously it's drained by, you know, uh, venously by the cystic veins, uh, which will then join the hepatic vein, uh, and then will, um, obviously, uh, drain into the inferior, uh, vena cava all the way into the heart, the right side of the heart. Um, <clears throat> it's innervated by the hepatic plexus. Uh, last, uh, Last organ when it comes to um, other accessory organs of the GIT, you have the pancreas. Um, and a pancreas is actually a secondary retroperitoneal organ. So what I mean to say is that uh, it actually starts off intraperitoneal. And as uh, we evolve embryologically, um, when we're in, you know, when when we're a, a fetus, 
uh, it actually is pushed backwards. So that's what makes it a secondary retroperitoneal because it starts off intraperitoneal and it moves back um, retro. <coughs> it's a gland uh, with both exocrine and endocrine functions. Um, this isn't a physiology lecture, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, and obviously it's uh, it's composed of lobules here. You can see from this image, actually, uh, these are slight lobules. There's also, uh, it's covered in a lot of fat as well, usually, um, but you can usually uh, make out the lobules. And um, it doesn't look yellow in real life. It usually looks quite gray. Um, <clears throat> sometimes even greyish pink. Um, it's around 12 to 16 centimetres long and it is um, <clears throat> almost uh, surrounded here, kind of cradled by the uh, the duodenum, all the aspects of the duodenum here. Um, and you have the head, uh, you have the, the neck and the body here and then the tail. Um, and the head is, um, it depends where you read it, but I think uh, most uh, books will say that the head is actually intraperitoneal and the body, neck and tail are actually retroperitoneal. Uh, but once again, just cross check my um, statements and please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I think the head is actually intraperitoneal always and the rest is retro. Um, <clears throat> Since P-wise, uh, anteriorly you would have the transverse colon um, passing in front of it if you're looking at it from the pancreas. Um, you'd have the posterior wall of the stomach um, through the amental bursa. Uh, the amental bursa or the um, epiploic foramen uh, is a very, very important um, topographical um, for Raymond, uh, once again, I can't really go into it in too much detail in this lecture, but um, if you guys message me, I, I have a, a lecture separately, which which has all of this. I, I, I can send that to you. Um, <clears throat> and, and yeah, and then posteriorly, so behind the, uh, the pancreas, you would find uh, the, <coughs> the inferior vena cava, which will be, uh, which is usually to the... Uh, if you're looking posteriorly, it will be on the right side. Um, and the uh, abdominal aorta will be um, will be passing um, towards the left side. Um, and uh, you know, like I said, you, you have the left kidney posteriorly here. You have the left suprarenal gland, obviously. And you have the renal uh, artery and the renal vein. Um, and the left cruise of the diaphragm, which you would be in contact with. Um, yeah, this is the pancreas. Um, okay, I mentioned this a little bit before, um, but you obviously have the head. You have the head, um, body, and the tail, and also the neck. Uh, and the head, uh, in terms of the head, the duodenum is uh, to the right side. Um, and posteriorly, you'd find the um, superior mesenteric um, vein and the, the splenic vein, which form the portal vein, which I mentioned uh, earlier on in the lecture, if you guys were listening. Um, and it's separated by the inferior vena cava and the abdominal um, aorta by the triates ligament. Um, or the suspensory ligament of the duodenum, which is right here, <coughs> right here. You can't see it in this image, but uh, it will be here in any other image. Um, and yeah, you also have a, a notch uh, which contains uh, superior mesenteric vessels posteriorly, so it will be behind, obviously, uh, and this bit here is an extension of the pancreas and it's known as the uh, insinate process um, and like I've written here it's an extension of the head behind the superior mesenteric vessels um, the body uh, it's obviously bulging into the omentum because you have a huge covering of um, the omental 
um, surface. Um, and so everything is posterior to the omentum, really, if you think about it. Um, but there are um, openings where you can have connections to the stomach, or you can see the, the stomach, and that's a foramen. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it's the the mental, or oh, sorry, the uh, epiploic foramen, um, and and yeah. Um, in terms of the body, you've got all of the grooves here um, for the splenic vein and the splenic artery. The vein is uh, running inferiorly, and the artery is running superior. Um, and the tail. Uh, which will reach the visceral surface of the spleen. So the visceral surface meaning the inside of the spleen. So if you just follow this, uh, the mouse, this would roughly be the spleen. It's in contact with the visceral surface. <coughs> and uh, the tail uh, will give off, it won't give off, but it will have a, uh, a connection with the spleen, uh, and especially the splenic vessels. Um, <clears throat> and that's called the splenorenal ligament. Uh, and then last but not least, you have the parenchyma. Um, by parenchyma, I mean the alpha cells, I mean the beta cells, I mean the um, you know, pancreatic um, <clears throat> unit cells, uh, which are producing a, a wide variety of uh, enzymes. Uh, like I said, it's not a physiology lecture, it's anatomy. Um, but if you have um, an interest in that, you can read it up in your in your spare time, and it will definitely help you in, in the end of the exam if you have to talk or if you're out of ideas. <coughs> so, um, clinical correlation of the greater momentum. Um, this is our stomach. <coughs> This is our omentum. Um, I know it looks like it's it has vessels entering it, but um, they're not actually vessels um, for uh, the omentum, they're, they're for the, the stomach. Uh, and in most cases, that's probably the gastroepiploic um, uh, vessel anastomosis on the right side and the left side. Uh, this is obviously your huge gland you can't miss this this is the uh, the liver <clears throat> see a diaphragm here uh, and the clinical uh, relevance of the greater momentum this is something that uh, you don't really read up about in any book um, and I think it's mentioned in very very few lectures um, but uh, in the lectures that uh, people have seen it in it's very important because it contains a lot of lymphocytes um, and any abdominal uh, operation um, usually uh, if we can we try to cover the <clears throat> well not me but uh, the surgeon will try and cover the um, the uh, surgical site uh, with omentum um, and uh, usually that helps in the healing process um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it just prevents complications. It prevents um, surgical wound infections and, um, you know, any spillage of contents, etc. So the momentum is quite important um, <clears throat> when it comes to that. <coughs> okay, now to carry on with our original kind of um, gastrointestinal story. Um, so small, the small uh, intestine... So the first part of the small intestine is the duodenum. Uh, like I've mentioned, I think we have a rough idea of the syntope, what's behind it, what's in front of it um, already, uh, but we'll just go through it roughly. Uh, so it's a she, she, C-shaped, um, uh, it's a C-shaped um, structure, <coughs> and uh, it's around... 25 centimeters long, uh, and it wraps around the um, the head of the pancreas. Um, like I said, it kind of you know basically cuddling it. And you have four parts. So you have the superior part, uh, which is you could say the first part. Then you have the second part, which is the descending, 
um, then you have the inferior part, and then you have the ascending part, uh, which is the fourth part of the uh, duodenum. Uh, so in the superior part, you um, or or the cap, it's also known as the cap, uh, and it's usually at the level of L1, and it's a continuation uh, from the stomach, especially the pylorus, um, <clears throat> and it is connected to the liver uh, by the hepatoduodenal ligament, um, which will be in front of it, right here. Um, and obviously you get the descending part, uh, this is roughly from the levels of L1 to L3, um, and uh, it curves inferiorly around the head of the pancreas, um, posterior to the transverse colon, and it is uh, obviously anterior to the right kidney, so the kidneys are behind, uh, because they're retroperitoneal. And this is the part which will also contain uh, the major duodenal papilla, and the opening here, which will also be a, which will also be covered by a, a sphincter here. I'm trying to zoom in, but I can't. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> but this bit right here is the major duodenal papilla, uh, vatus papilla, uh, and it contains a sphincter on the outside. Uh, it's the opening um, for passing bile uh, into the. Uh, digested contents of the stump. Uh, and then the inferior part, the third part, uh, it travels laterally to the left um, <clears throat> and it crosses the inferior vena cava in the aorta which will be posterior um, and it's also posterior to the um, superior mesenteric artery um, <clears throat> which is an important landmark um, when it comes to operations. Um, the final part is the ascending part. Uh, it starts off in L3, but it actually ends off in L2, which is why I've written L3 to L2 and not L2 to L3. Um, so once it crosses the aorta, it will ascend and curve anteriorly. So it will ascend and curve anteriorly, worldwide, uh, to join the jejunum. Uh, and this turn here is known as the duodeno uh, jejunal flexure um, and at this flexure here, the DJ flexure uh, you'll find the suspensory um, ligament of trite and you'll also find the suspensory muscle um, and when this muscle contracts it actually widens the angle of this flexure which it looks kind of uh, like a swan's head uh, but it widens it and it allows um, all of your uh, gastric contents to pass through into the jejunum where they will be you know, absorbed further on. Um, that's the small intestine. Uh, then, like I said, you follow on to the jejunum and the ileum. Um, and in contrast to the duodenum, uh, it is actually intraperitoneal, so it's in the peritoneal cavity and it is attached to the posterior abdominal wall by the mesentery. So this is this kind of paper sheet lining you can see here. Uh, this is the mesentery. <clears throat> the mesentery is a fold which um, you know, uh, keeps um, all of the intraperitoneal organs um, perfused and also uh, in their structures. <clears throat> and uh, it's roughly six meters long, which is quite long. Um, and uh, the jejunum makes up, uh, you know, eight feet. Um, so basically, um, you know, the first, you could say the first 40 percent of the small intestine completely is the jejunum. And the uh, well, the sixty percent of it further on from that point is the ileum, and the uh, the jejunum starts at the uh, duodeno jejunal flexure. Uh, sorry about that. 
but uh, yeah, so we'll start at the DJ Fletcher, um, and there's no clear um, demarcation point between um, you know what is the uh, the jejunum and uh, what is the ilium, um, but. Uh, if you look at it from um, a histology point of view, so if you, for example, if you took a biopsy, or if you, you know, took other samples, you would find that. Um, actually, we can discuss that in the next slide. Um, but you would find subtle differences, which would be really um, crucial to differentiating between the jejunum and the ileum. Um, and the terminal point of the ileum is the ileocecal valve. Uh, now this valve uh, will then invaginate into the cecum. So this will be your cecum. Can't see it very clearly, but in this region here, this is obviously your appendix. Um, and the appendix is not part of the small intestine. It's probably, um, but it's by definition actually a part of the large, the large intestine. Um, and um, the content of uh, the food or liquid um, at this point they can't be um, propulsed or propagated forward um, but the valve can uh, prevent reflux back into um, the small intestine um, so the whole idea of all of these valves and um, these sphincters is to kind of keep all the food going and to kind of progress it uh, all the way along the um, entire tract rather than uh, letting some of it go back because that's when issues start. <clears throat> so like I mentioned in the previous slide, um, if you um, discuss uh, histology or histological differences um, within the jejunum and the helium, uh, you would probably find that uh, the jejunum is um, much more thicker, and when it's when 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 it's thicker, it actually has a larger lumen. Um, it's not very clear in this image, but it does have a larger lumen than the ileum, um, which has a thin wall. The uh, vasa recta, which um, are the uh, it's the blood, um, or it's the architecture, which is supplying the blood supply to the uh, small intestine. This will be quite long in the uh, jejunum. So in the first eight feet um, of the GIT, or sorry, of the small intestine, um, the vasa recta will be quite long because it's the jejunum. And then from that point onwards, um, they're usually quite short. Um, but they have um, kind of like a uh, <coughs> a, uh, a network uh, which is known as arcades, and they have more arcades than the uh, than the jejunum. Um, yeah, uh, and uh, an interesting point is that you can have up to uh, two fifths of the intestine um, surgically removed. Um, and there would be no physiological disturbance. So by physiological disturbance, what I mean um, that, uh, for example, there wouldn't be too much discrepancy between, um, for example, um, reabsorption. Um, all of your uh, individual units, all of your transporter, um, transporter cells, for example, when it comes to biochemistry, all of them would be working physiologically. There would also be peristalsis, um, <clears throat> and yeah, it would be functioning normally. It would be um, propulsing and propagating food forwards and not backwards, uh, so there'd be no risk of bowel obstruction um, <clears throat> or malabsorption, more importantly as well. And we're kind of kind of getting to the end of the the story now, but um, now we're in the uh, large intestine. Uh, so the large intestine is, um, well, it's 150 centimeters in length um, and from proximal um, to distal, proximal to the iliocecal valve, I meant, I meant to write, 
you have the ascending part of the colon, then you have the descending, oh sorry, you have the ascending, you have the transverse, then you have the descending, then you have the sigmoid part of the colon, um, and then before you get to the rectum, then you have the anal canal. Um, so, you know, without further ado, uh, the ascending colon is retroperitoneal, um, so you wouldn't be able to see it uh, if you open up the, perit um, the abdominal cavity. Um, and uh, it ascends um, upwards, obviously, and it meets the right lobe of the liver, where uh, you would also find the um, colic impression of the, the liver. Um, and this section here, where it um, just before it um, starts, uh, or just before the transverse colon starts, before it, um, you have a flexure here, which is called the right colic flexure. It's also known as the hepatic flexure. Um, and this flexure um, signifies the start of the transverse colon. Um, so similarly. That would mean that when we got to the end of the transverse colon, um, it would be the descending colon. Um, and the going back to the transverse colon, so it will extend all the way um, uh, all the way to the spleen, uh, where then it will turn 90 degrees inferiorly. Um, <clears throat> and this is obviously known as the left colic flexure or the splenic flexure because the spleen is obviously in this part of the um, abdominal quadrants and this part of the uh, intestine and it's also the part where the colon is um, attached to the diaphragm by the phrenico um, colic ligament and this is actually the least fixed part of the colon um, this is why um, for example, if you've ever seen uh, seen an operation or um, <clears throat> you've seen some images possibly, it doesn't always look as clear-cut like this. Sometimes this part can actually be found a bit a bit lower. Um, so yeah, it's but but this part is an intraperitoneal and it is enclosed by um, the the transverse mesocolon. Uh, which is an extension of the, the mesentery again. Um, you can see it right here. Um, and then, like I said, this is the uh, descending colon. Um, <clears throat> we'll move infra, sorry, it will move um, inferiorly towards the pelvis, and it's also retroperitoneal, and it is anterior to the left kidney. Um, and when it turns medially and um, posteriorly, um, it becomes the sigmoid colon. <clears throat> and then another point is, I just want to point out that you can see these um, epiploic appendages, uh, which are just strips of fat, um, really, um, which just cover the, uh, the entire large intestine. <laughs> Um, and then once you're in the, um, once you get to the inferior most part of the descending colon, then you're obviously into the sigmoid colon. Sigmoid is uh, roughly uh, 40 centimeters, and in the uh, left inferior quadrant um, of um, of the body quadrants. Um, and um, the reason why, um, or for example, something that helped me um, remember sigmoid um, is that it extends from the left iliac fossa, so left iliac fossa here, all the way back to S3. Um, this gives it its S shape, <coughs> um, S for sigmoid. So easy way of remembering it, and easy way of remembering its, um, its pathway. And it is uh, attached once again to the posterior pelvic wall and the mesentery. 
um, by the sigmoid mesocolon. Uh, you can't really see it very well in this image, but there's sigmoid mesocolon here, and it will also cover, or part of the peritoneum will also cover um, the superior anterior aspects of the rectum, which we're now going to talk about. Um, so, <clears throat> like we had to differentiate um, between um, the jejunum and the ileum, um, <clears throat> it seems pretty simple, but uh, it is important to differentiate between the small and the large, um, because sometimes it can be quite hard. Um, <clears throat> easiest way of um, of uh, differentiating between it will be that you will find epiploic appendages, which are just like I mentioned before. It's just a bunch of um, fatty strips, um, and it's, it has no function. Um, and then uh, you'll find Haustra. So Haustra, they kind of look like bulging um, sacs, and they kind of cover the entire <clears throat> entire length of the intestine. If you if I just uh, go to the last slide, so you have these um, Haustra here, which are just bulges and extensions, essentially of what's inside, and um, they are produced when the tania um, coli um, contract um, and the tania coli are uh, actual strips of muscle so there's, there's a tiny little bit of muscle and once again this just keeps everything going forwards um, <clears throat> and uh, en route to being expelled from the body and how straw are produced um, after these strips of muscles contract. So <clears throat> the um, clinical correlation to this is um, uh, a procedure known as the anterior resection. So this is when um, <clears throat> essentially we remove this entire um, aspect from the sigmoid all the way to um, the uh, ileum of the uh, small intestine um, and the reason why we do this can be because of uh, cancer uh, it can be due to uh, inflammatory bowel disease so Crohn's or ulcerative colitis um, and also diverticulitis so for those who don't know what diverticulitis is, um, it's when you have small holes um, in between, um, uh, or oh, sorry, you have small holes in the uh, lumen of the uh, intestine and uh, what can happen is sometimes um, your f uh, feces can uh, become trapped inside uh, and that can cause inflammation, it can sometimes cause them to perforate, which is when um, the pressure inside that little sac is so much that it essentially explodes. Um, so you have a bunch of feces inside your peritoneum, which can cause uh, <clears throat> all different kinds of infections. Um, so yeah, um, so this is its correlation. And then the last two parts of it. Uh, you have the rectum, um, which is the extension of the sigmoid, um, and it is a temporary storage uh, site for feces, um, and um, it will terminate into the anal canal. Um, it begins at S3, um, and uh, macroscopically it is actually different from um, the entire large intestine um, because its final segment is the ampulla. So this here is the ampulla, so it's a huge, um, uh, hard to say, it's 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 an ampule basically, it's, um, it's like a big, um, uh, or you could say it's the widest part of this, um, this part of the large intestine. Um, 
and it obviously then continues with the anal canal. And um, the course of the rectum is marked by two major flexures. Um, and this is what um, people don't uh, understand because it looks as if it's very clear cut. It you know, passes through the sigmoid and it goes straight to the anus. Um, but actually there are two major flexures. So you have the sacral flexure. And this is when uh, you have a anterior posterior curve uh, anteriorly, which will follow the curve of the sacrum and the coccyx. Um, and then after that point, then you have the anorectal flexure, uh, which is when the um, or which is when the rectum will then um, curve once again anterior posteriorly with convexity more anteriorly, um, and then will follow into the anus. Uh, and this is formed by um, a tone of uh, the puborectalis muscle, which is one of the pelvic floor muscles, <coughs> and um, we can then um, break down the rectum into the superior part, um, <coughs> which is the um, superior um, third, um, and it's anteriorly and laterally um, covered by the peritoneum. Uh, like I said, so this part is actually called the mesorectum, um, and so it would be intraperitoneal. Uh, in the middle third, um, only the anterior aspect is actually covered by the peritoneum. And the lower third has none, um, so um, it doesn't have any folds. Um, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and the reflections, another important part is the reflections of the peritoneum from the, the rectum, so the rectum which is here. Uh, in terms of the posterior wall, uh, they can form pouches, um, and two important pouches, um, they're different in males and females as you can see in this image. Um, so in the females, you obviously have the uterus which is anterior to it, um, and so you can form a small pouch here which could sometimes be a collection for any kind of um, liquid, it doesn't have to be what you'd like, like it to be. Uh, it can be all kinds of different <coughs> pathological li uh, liquid, and that can sometimes be found here in the recto-uterine pouch. Or um, you can sometimes um, have another pathological um, extension pouch, which is called the vesico-uterine pouch. Um, but actually, just to correct myself, it doesn't have to be pathological. Um, <coughs> it, it's quite normal to find... Um, a pouch there. And then in the males, uh, obviously you just have the urinary bladder there, so you would just have the recto-vesical pouch. Um, and uh, an important and confusing part of um, the blood supply uh, is that uh, superiorly, um, the superior third is actually supplied by the um, superior rectal um, artery, which is a um, direct branch of the inferior mesenteric artery, and the middle third is um, supplied by the middle rectal artery, which is a branch of the internal iliac artery, um, <clears throat> and the inferior most part, before you get to um, <clears throat> the anal canal, that is um, the, that blood supply is coming from the um, internal pudendal artery um, and then the corresponding veins are just like the arteries so you'd expect to have a superior rectal vein and vice versa for the following two and they were all anastomosed from the portocaval anastomosis <coughs> which will um, all lead to the inferior uh, vena cava um, and uh, inevitably end up back at the right side of the heart um, and then uh, just a quick note uh, on the nervous system. Uh, so sympathetic innervation will be from uh, the lumbar splanchnic nerves um, and also the uh, superior and inferior hypogastric plexuses, um, whereas the para will be from the um, corresponding parasympathetic 
um, plexuses, so you'd have the inferior hypogastric um, and the pelvic splanchnic nerves. Um, and yeah, and the visceral efferent sentry fibers would be following the parasupply. Uh, that's an important part. <clears throat> right, and the last bit um, is the anal canal. So this is obviously the final segment of the GIT. Um, and uh, its most important role is uh, in defecation and maintaining uh, fecal continence. So by that I mean um, tone uh, to not prevent um, feces from leaking out. So unfortunately when you get old um, you can become incontinent and that's because of your dysfunction of the sphincter muscles. Um, <clears throat> and uh, So it has two sphincters has an internal sphincter which is right here internal because it's innermost and then external because <coughs> it's external it's outermost um, and the internal actually surrounds um, the upper two-thirds uh, of the anal canal and um, it's uh, formed by the thickening of the involuntary um, circular smooth muscles in the bowel wall um, <coughs> And the external is a voluntary muscle um, which surrounds the lower third and um, what happens is um, at some points, uh, especially this uh, this line here, the pectinate line, you have um, some kind of fusion between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter uh, where they blend in together with the puborectalis muscle of the pelvic floor. Um, and uh, yeah, so a few points uh, at the junction of the rectum. So you've got the rectum here. This is the ampulla of the rectum, which is the the, the widest part. Um, there's a muscular ring. So this is known as the um, anorectal ring, um, and it's found in uh, when we examine um, via the rectum. And this is the fusion of. Um, the internal sphincter, the external, and the puborectalis muscle. Um, and so this is the ring. We will feel this uh, when we examine. Um, and just inferior to it, you will have these um, columns. And these columns um, join to form uh, valves. And these, these, uh, these valves aren't actual valves, um, but... <clears throat> they're, they're more so small um, pouches uh, known as um, anal sinuses which um, secrete mucus um, and then the valves um, co collectively form in a regular circle you have to imagine they're forming a circle here um, and this is known as the pectinate line or the dentate line and that will divide the anal canal into the upper part and the lower part um, and this is uh, <clears throat> one of the most distinguishing points between the um, the two parts of the anal canal and also the um, embryological origin and the neurovascular supply um, because the uh, upper part will obviously be supplied by the superior rectal artery and this part will be supplied by, or the lower part will be supplied by the inferior um, rectal artery. So clinical um, correlation here is when it comes to endoscopy because uh, you have to know if you're in the, the rectum or if you're in the sigmoid. Um, so I apologize for the graphic images but um, this is when the endoscope is inverted uh, on itself and this is uh, basically testing for external anal sphincter tone so as we can see in this patient they had good tone um, and this is a function of the internal sorry the external anal sphincter um, yeah this this following image is um, I don't know if you, maybe you guys don't know this, but I will um, not explain it to you. This uh, is, you're basically, um, imagine that you've just gone through the uh, rectum and you're now in the sigmoid. And this 
is a bunch of um, cancerous cells. There's uh, a lot of hyperplasia here, uh, so the um, epithelium has started to uh, replicate, mass replicate, and it's probably started, um, you know, um, metastasizing and also infiltrating behind um, these structures. And what it causes is um, bowel obstruction in the sigmoid region. So bowel obstruction meaning that nothing can pass through because there's so many cells here. So um, all of the um, contents that we've digested over the, the entire story, uh, they can't pass through and they can't be expelled by the anus because of this cancer here. So, yeah. Now, the last... Um, the final part, uh, which is going to answer a few questions, is going to be the uh, interactive um, <clears throat> aspect to um, the lecture, and just to consolidate, making sure that everyone um, has you know understood everything. Quite easy questions, um, so let's um, <clears throat> so let's go through the first question, and why don't you guys? Uh, tell me which of the options you think it is. Um, so yeah, so starting from now, please comment uh, what you think the answer for the first question is. No one wants to answer. Okay, well, the answer is A. Uh, the duodenum is positioned by the sus suspensory ligament. Uh, of triates at the duodeno jejunal flexure. Uh, how about the second question? Uh, so the answer is actually A, again.
Yeah, uh, so the answer is actually A, um, again, because, like I mentioned, the ileum contains more vascular arcades, um, but it is narrower in diameter, implying that it has a smaller ileum. Um, <clears throat> and um, another important thing, just to revise again, is that the ileum um, has a shorter uh, vasorector, um, but obviously more vascular arcades. So, what about the third, the third question, um, and the fourth question? If if you're watching, um, why don't uh, why don't you comment um, both of your answers in the same comment? Yeah, uh, so the third one is the B, that's the inferior rectal artery, and yeah, like like you guys are right, um, the fourth is C6, um, and obviously it terminates at T11. Uh, the final one, these are very simple, um, but like I said, it's just important about nailing the basics, uh, so what do you guys think about Question five. Yeah, so uh, answer to question five is also um, it's quite, it's it's B is the transverse colon, um, and uh, that's because uh, the transverse colon is uh, covered by the peritoneum known as the mesocolon. Um, that's its connection to the posterior wall, um, uh, and yeah. So <clears throat> with that. Um, just a few final thoughts. Um, 
do you guys have any do you guys have any questions um i think it was uh quite basic and i think i've hopefully i've broken it down into digestible um snippets of information but do you guys have any questions I'm assuming no questions. Uh, so, my final thoughts um, and my final uh, tips are that I think you should keep um, keep it simple. Uh, and easiest way to remember that is obviously keep it simple, stupid, or keep it simple, sexy. Um, as long as you kind of um, keep everything basic and work from the start rather than um trying to explain really complex um things you won't really get anywhere and i think it annoys um anatomy um tutors and the, the the doctors uh and the professors um when you uh, go into complex topics um before even mentioning the simple things uh so yeah keep it simple keep it um basic first and then build on that uh, and another thing is I think remaining composed is just as important as having knowledge. You can have all of the knowledge in the world, but uh, if they start asking uh, questions and you get nervous um, and you're not relaxed and you're not um, kind of calm, kind of cool, calm and relaxed, um, you won't be able to kind of uh, think and they will become impatient. Um, so remain composed. Um, and just back your process because um, it will pay off um, and you will pass this exam uh, with flying colours. Um, but this doesn't just mean um, sitting in the library uh, with your book open or at home and just looking at it and um, you know just staring at it because um, unfortunately the information will not uh, diffuse into your head or um, you know it won't just magically appear. Uh, you will have to actively revise. And by actively revise, you have to keep on revisiting. You have to keep on drawing. You have to keep on looking. Um, um, you have to keep on looking at um, images of um, structures in the atlases. Um, so, yeah, just keep on repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, and drawing and drawing and drawing and reading, reading, reading. Um, and uh, it sounds very easy because it is quite easy because if you just keep it to those um, if you just keep uh, hitting those targets um, like I've mentioned uh, you will find that you can recall a lot more um, you can visualize things a lot easily and all of this will help you in the long run and it will uh, inevitably mean that you will pass the uh, anatomy exam um, so, so yeah, I mean, those are my final thoughts. My sources are, obviously I used the white book, uh, for some aspects. I also used, um, I used a website called, um, Teach Me Anatomy. Um, I used this when I was, um, uh, learning anatomy myself in the first year. Um, very simple, very basic, very useful, very helpful. Um, and they also have some small quizzes uh, on that website. Uh, and then secondly, um, I also use Chorasio's Human Anatomy. Uh, I think this is another great book. And I would recommend you um, you to read it because um, it does explain a lot of things such as head and neck and um, the pelvis uh, really well. Um, and in some parts better than the white book. Um, so those are my sources. Um, and yeah, 
if you are watching this live stream, um, thank you for tuning in. Um, I hope some of it made some sense. I hope you weren't too bored. Um, and uh, the link uh, to the feedback um, for this for this lecture is, is in this QR code right now. So um, if you could just scan this or just take a picture of it and just fill the feedback form out, that would be um, greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope you guys uh, all have a nice um, remaining um, afternoon and evening um, and take care and stay safe um, and yeah I hope this was useful so thank you for tuning in